Hey, welcome back to the study of the Minor Prophets. And I'm excited to say, and sad to say, uh, we, we're at the last book. We're in the book of Malachi, but we're in chapter 4. And, and this will probably be a, a light, a light uh, teaching today because it's, it's only six verses. But, uh, you know, we're ending the last book of the Old Testament. And we're reading the last chapter of the last book, Malachi chapter 4. And we have been studying the prophets, minor prophets, for the last several months. And I hope you have been grazing on these chapters now that all, that we've all went through. And no, 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 no. And I'm not calling you guys farm animals or anything like that. But when animals graze, they spend times enjoying what they are eating. If you ever go, you know, go to the countryside or go to somebody who owns a farm or, or has cattle or has sheep or has horses, or whatever. When they sit there and eat, they, they graze. And it's in something they enjoy. And it's, and it's something for us to do as we... Uh, no, once again, I'm not calling anybody animals or farm animals, but take take an example from them as and spend time enjoying what you're reading and eating. And as you read the Word of God, I'm hoping that you're taking the time to enjoy what God is doing in your life. And I hope you changed. I hope you generally changed over the last several months and you've learned how God worked through minor prophets to His people and how they were there to teach Him and, and to sh tell them what God was asking them of them to do. And and you can see that each of these prophets, that they all had some challenges they had to face. And like us, we face challenges every day in our lives. And these are the things, you know, we can glean off of them, you know, and, and to learn. But this is, like I said, a short chapter. It has a, a lot to tell us, though. There are six verses here before we enter into a 400-year period of time where there's a silence before we hear God moving again through John the Baptist in the New Testament. Um, and what is interesting here is that we read Malachi talk about the one who is coming. And lo and behold, we see that after 400 years, it's of the signs in the New Testament, it's John the Baptist. So it's, it, it's neat how there's a, a continuation. But also in this, in this section here that we're going to read today, um, it does tell us about the second coming of Christ. So uh, get excited. Uh, get your Bibles open, if you will to the book of Malachi, and we'll be at the fourth chapter. Uh, it should say, The Great Day of the Lord. Once again, I'll be out of the ESV. It says in verse 1, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oxen, uh, when all arrogant evil evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming, shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will, be, will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, let's stop here for a second and or a minute and say we're dealing with a term that has been dealing with for many, many, many times in the Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord. Um, maybe you've heard it. Maybe you spoke it. Maybe you don't know what it means yet. But this is a, uh, a time period where the Lord spoke that He will judge the earth. Uh, he will bring final judgment to us. But not to us in a sense as um, believers, us to us as human beings who He has placed on the earth. Uh, he's here speaking to the arrogant and uh, all evildoers. Now, that's a very short list of description, basically. Uh, this is in part the question we get from time to time is, when is God going to deal with the evil in the world? Now, even like, think about now, even with this coronavirus and all, then the coronavirus has kind of died down, and now after the, the, the loss of that man, the, the innocent man that got killed um, by the police officer, the you know it's good to protest and good to speak up about things that are wrong in our society, but you cross the line when you start blowing up uh, WalMarts and Targets and people's stores, uh, and you think, God, when are you going to come back and rescue our people, rescue this world? I mean, I can't wait because you know what? When Jesus steps down on this place, there ain't nothing like that happening. He will deal with it, um, and I get excited about that. But I get fearful in a sense that do the people know who have rejected Christ what is coming? And do the people who have put their faith in Christ know what is coming? It's important. It's a good question for both people. Um, if God is the God of justice and he hates wickedness, why is sin so rampant? Why does he not deal with it all? So a lot of times we get those questions. And maybe you've gotten them. And maybe you've answered them a little differently than I do. But know that God will deal with this. You know, we, we want it right in the here and now. But he says, I'm waiting. And God has set apart 
a day where God will set some time to deal with all the wickedness and all the people who reject Jesus' mercy and Jesus' grace. We get a clear sense of this. Um, this is not a day we look forward to, though, for those people who are on earth. It's going to be a hard, sad day. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 3 says, For the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds and a time of doom. Listen, for the nations. Right there, Ezekiel is telling them, it's coming. Joel 2.11, the Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Obadiah 1, verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deed shall return to you on your own head. Basically, listen, these verses in this, that God will not and cannot brush sin that the people have committed under the rug. It's not going to happen. There will be a day the judgment will come. Now, there will be a day where payment will be required, and the day of the Lord is that payment for one's actions. But God has made a way for us to escape that final judgment through the accepting of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to surrender to Him. Where, wow, we live here on earth. When we go to the cross where Jesus willingly bore our full punishment of what we deserve, what we deserve from God is his full wrath Jesus took for us. And by, and by receiving what Jesus has done for us on the cross, this whole judgment we're talking about was done for us. And you and I, if you're a believer, in the past. And for those who have rejected Jesus, this judgment is yet to come. So listen, when you when someone gives their heart to Jesus Christ, when they send when when they send in the past, the present, the future, Christ paid for that. So judgment was paid. My judgment was already paid by Jesus Christ over two thousand years ago. I don't have to worry about it. He take, he took care of me. For those who don't believe in Christ, who do not follow Christ, who do not have Jesus in their heart and live for Jesus, their punishment is yet to come, future. And this is what we're talking about to, to here. Uh, Malachi is preaching here from a time yet to come. If you and I, judgment is in the past. If we would just humble ourselves and receive what Christ has done for us all of Calvary, know that our sins are forgiven because of Jesus. Um, if that was something that you have not done yet, please do. Don't. If you're watching this for the first time, maybe the second time, and if you haven't walked with God, if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, I say do it, do it, and do it now. It's it's simple. It says just confess your sins to Christ. Ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. Surrender your life to Him and ask Him to live in your heart. And then live for Him. Live your life for Him. Get into a good church. Get into a, a good Bible uh, speaking church. Uh, get into a place that will encourage you and uh, love you. Will surround you and help you whenever you're in need. You know. So let's get back to the scripture real quick. He said God promised a fire. For his people back in Malachi chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. And here God promises fire for the wicked. But there's a big difference between the refining fire that applied to God's people to me and you. Like in Meshach, Chadak, and Abednego. If you remember those guys uh, from the Old Testament. Where they were placed in the fire uh, for not bowing down to, to, the, to the king and false gods. And they stood and said, no, we won't. And they stood for God and God rescued them in that place. And that's that refining fire for us is when God takes the impurities that's in our lives and, and he gets rid of them. That's the refining fire to make us more like him, to be closer to him. You know what I mean? Um, but the fire that he's speaking about to the ungodly, it's, it's not a good one. It's, it's, it, it's going to burn. Um, when judgment comes, it will be too late for them. So, you know, like I said, why doesn't God come now? Apostle Peter says this. You know, why doesn't God come now? You think about it. Why not? Because God does not want, the, want any to perish. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this, first of all, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, falling on their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. We have been waiting. More as, it's like this. People are saying, we've been waiting for such a long time, and we're getting tired of this. And these people are the ones who are casting doubt about who God is, God's character, and God's word. But 
But jump down to verse 9 in that same chapter. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing, listen, that any should perish, but they all, he said, how many? All should reach repentance. You know, sometimes we say, you know what, God, God's not coming. He's, he's not going to do it. He, it, it, it. His word's no good. You know, people say, you know, I don't know. I've been waiting too long. I don't think it's going to happen. And, but guys, listen, God does not want anyone to perish. Remember, we're always creation, but we're not always children. It's a big difference. And God wants all of his creation to bow their knee. And one day they will, whether you were on his side or you're not on his side. We're all going to bow a knee. Um, this is why there is a delay. God is giving people time to repent, to receive his grace and mercy. It's a free gift. Why would you Why would you turn down a free gift? I mean, I can understand maybe an ugly sweater or a tie or something, but you still would receive the thing. Most people would probably re-gift it. But this is a gift that we should re-gift in the sense that I get this gift, I have Christ in my heart, and I'd be able to share that with somebody else. You know, even when you read the book of Revelation or... And with the tribulation period where God still is repeatedly giving people opportunities to repent to come to him. By the time the end happens, the people that are left, the ones who continually rejected Jesus, they're in trouble. These are people that, it's not like they reject him here. These are people that in their heart they've seared their anger or hatred towards God, a rejection towards God. These are the ones, and but God yet, listen, and I know he knows all things, sees all things. But he gives people the opportunity to repent. Now, as we go into verse 2, we see that what's going on as kind of if we verse, read verse 2, it's about a believer's point, how the believer looks at it. The point of view for me and you, if you're a believer. It says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of righteousness shall rise with healings in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Now, I didn't say it. They, the Bible says you're calves. But first one, God promises a judgment of fire. And those who are proud, but those who choose to come, choose God, will be saved. Um, if you've ever been in a farm, like I mentioned, when the animals are let out. You ever, like We go to sometimes when my kids were little, we'd go to a petting zoo. And you know, sometimes you could see the animals. I mean, they didn't have a big area. It's, you're better off going to a zoo or a, maybe a, a zoo or a farm where they just let the animals out. Um, you can see the excitement in our steps. We're like, wow, I'm finally out. You know, just think about this lockdown. We went from red face to yellow. People are like, yeah, I can get out of my house. They, like doors bust open. They all start running. But visualize people of God who have, who have had with unspeakable joy and excitement of what God is doing in their, in their lives. So picture that in your mind, that they're just like, in verse 2, where it says, you shall go out leaping like calves from a stall. You know, did you ever see the, the guys that ride the bulls? You know, and they have that little piece of rope around the bull's neck. And as soon as they open the gate, the thing tries throwing them off. Probably kind of like that. Verse 3, and it says, You shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. God's people will be very joyful at this time, victorious, and when they show it by their actions. We, as a body of believers, need to show the joy of the Lord in our actions, in our lips, in our hearts. So why? So other people can see that joy. Uh, see, they realize that all the promises back then, they will realize that all the promises, all the words from God that God had shared and had passed on from uh, prophet to prophet and king to teachers and from people to people, that God's word is good and they're excited about it. It'll be a day of great rejoicing for them. Now remember, it says, verse 4, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Herb, for all of Israel. Now listen, in the Old Testament, God's people follow the law, right? Man related to God on the basis of the law. For us, we have the new covenant. Uh, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ, Jesus Christ. We live under grace. We, under, we have faith in Christ. We live in grace. Um, he knew we'd never be able to fulfill the law. He's the one who fulfilled the law. We couldn't. Um, but I like how he's Christ, you think about you take the Ten Commandments, and he summed it up in two commands. You know, to love the Lord your God, your all your heart, your mind, your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you think about when you study the Ten Commandments on your own, this is pretty much, you know, you don't steal, you honor your parents, you don't covet, 
you know, the lie, stuff like, you know, honor God. And he took all those, crunched them down, just to those two verses. That's a lot. See, under the old covenant, you would, under the old covenant, you tell the people, listen, follow the law, you're under the law, follow the law. Under the new covenant, there's a different exhortation. We look to Peter and what he says, but like Malachi, Peter is also talking about the coming of the Lord with judgment on people, but coming at, a, at it with a new Testament perspective. You know, how Malachi says, now Peter's a little different. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and that'll be in verse um, 14, 15, and then we're going to jump down to verse 18. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Or are you resting in God right now? Think about it. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. Jump down. Verse 18 says, But now grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Or, I'm sorry. But now grow in the grace and Lord, knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and the day of eternity. Amen. Now, this is a New Testament exhortation given to the people to know that judgment or the judge is coming to bring judgment to the earth. And how to live our lives on this earth. To trust and remember the, the blood of the Lamb, and that we need to be found blameless in that day. Not perfect, blameless. That we're doing it right. We're walking right. Nope. Noah was a man that was blameless. And there's a lot of people that were considered blameless. Not perfect, but blameless. Like Peter states, the warnings in us. Listen, and in other books, there are, there are warnings of false prophets and teachers that are out there. And we need to be careful uh, what leads us or who leads us or what teaching leads us. You know, there are times that even I heard myself that, that people say, well, you know what, we listen to what you say and we listen to what all these other different pastors say and we, we, we develop our own, uh, you know, theology, our own doctrine. I'm like, what's God saying? What's the scripture saying? What, when, I said, you can't follow eight different pastors. You can listen to them, but what's the Holy Spirit saying? Because you got to hear what the Word of God says, not, not what these other pastors say. What's, what's God speaking when you read the Word? And he says, there, I said, and, and, and Peter's saying, here, listen, there are people out there that will twist the Word just enough to get you off course because it's more of a, it's more of a flesh to draw them to them. Like there's, like there's, like there's, um, there was a, uh, a news thing that ran across uh, my phone about, you know, such and such a church has all this thing and they put all these gimmicks out and they try to get people in the church. But when people go down there, they see it as gimmicks. They don't see the genuine things being taught. And God wants us to be careful of what we listen to. And Peter restates this. Be careful of those out there who are false prophets and teachers that lead us astray. You know, think about a, a, a big cruise liner, you know, and they set everything on a, on a compass. They have directions. But if they're one degree off, you know, say after 10 miles of on the ocean, they're going to be off big distance. And if someone teaches you just you know, a little bit of leaven, be careful what you listen to and what you hear. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning... If you're a believer in Christ, you have the Spirit of God living inside you. He will say, listen, that's not true. That's not right. That's not that's not what God's Word is saying. And study yourself. Like the Brains did. Study the Word of God yourself. And find the answers that you need. And 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 know what the truth is. Amen. I don't want to I don't want to beat on this, but you know, we need to be in a place that we are studying God's Word and, and dividing the Word correctly. Amen? Let's continue. Verse 5 and 6, we'll take these next couple. Uh, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Okay, that's interesting. 
We'll see how that one works out. Elijah's coming. Think about it. We'll catch. We'll 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 touch base in a minute. And he will he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest they come and strike the land with a decree of their destruction. Well, that's the end of um, the six verses. But God promises in these last verses that he will send Elijah in a, in a preparatory way when the day of the Lord comes. So, now, if you remember, Enoch, or I think it was Enoch and Elijah did not experience a physical death. Well, with Elijah here, though, we'll, we'll talk about Elijah. Elijah, he simply was just taken up. And uh, he was taken up to be with the Lord while Elisha watched. Remember the double portion? Grab the mantle. Remember, and, and, and he was faithful. God was faithful. Double portions. I mean, and Elijah went, moved forward. Now, we're told here that Elijah will return. And this has been debated, though, by others on how and exactly. Is it really him or what's going on here? And, and, there's a, and as you study that, that will he be one of the two men... That's mentioned in the book of Revelations. And there's the, some discussions that are out there. Some say yes, some say no. Some say it's these two guys, some say it's these two guys. This is something that's not to divide, has nothing to do with salvation, but it's something that you can't study on to learn, to get to, 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 to get to understand what's going on in this passage. Um, Malachi chapter 4 is the only Old Testament prophetic passage where we read that Elijah is to return and with one simple passage in there has been much debate over years. Here's some of the things that were told about this scripture. Some believe that this was fulfilled with John the Baptist. Malachi, remember Malachi 3.1. He was prepared away from me. Uh, remember, no, remember, I think last week we talked about this. Jesus quotes Malachi in relations with Jesus. Um, Malachi verse 4 or 5, we just talked about that. The Lord predicts the return of Elijah, remember? And then we also see this in Luke. Luke 1, 17. The angel predicts that John the Baptist will minister in the spirit and the power of Elijah. John 1, 21 says, uh, when, he was, when, John, when he was questioned, uh, John denies being Elijah. He says, listen, I'm, I'm not Elijah, I'm John, right? Uh, Matthew 11, 4, 11, 14, verse 14 says, Jesus points to John as the fulfillment of Elijah's return. And then Matthew 17, 11, Jesus affirms the prophecies of Elijah's return and says that in John, he already came. Now, when you think about this, what do we learn from all this? That we know that the Lord said Elijah will return before the coming of Christ. John denies that he is Elijah. Then we see from Luke, uh, when the angel told jo uh, John's dad, hey, John would minister in the spirit of and the power of Elijah. And then we see that Jesus points to John as fulfillment of Elijah. So we you get some you get some conflicting things here, like, is it here? Is it him? Is it not? You know, what what kind of wrap this up for me? Because, you know, um not sure. Even now that you're you're confusing me, so from all those scriptures that I pulled out, I came to basically two conclusions of this. First one is this: if John if John the Baptist fulfills the prophecy concerning the coming Elijah, okay, it's done. Okay, if you look at it that way, that's one conclusion I come with. John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy concerning the coming Elijah. That's one way we can look at it. Okay, or the second one I came up with is this. John the, Baptist, John the Baptist partially fulfills the prophecy of the coming of Elijah. Now, because it says Elijah will return in the tribulation period in the person of the two witnesses. This is a guess. It's not, the Bible's not really clear. It's only a guess. It's something, I don't want to say this, it's a gray area. I don't like gray area. I'm kind of a black or white person. You know what I mean? It's either black or white. Gray, I kind of, this is one of those gray areas. It's not clear. We, we just don't know. So why would someone come to this conclusion that, that this is a partial fulfillment and not a full fulfillment? I'll give you, I'll give you three different ways I, I looked at this. The wording on Malachi 4 that it says, Behold, I will send you, or send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. 
Okay, that's the first one. We don't consider the time of John the Baptist. Listen, and Jesus' first coming, remember? Book of Matthew, as a great and dreadful day in the Lord, do we? This is why this is why this I'm gonna go with number two. Pick two. I'm more comfortable with pick two. Because of because of even the scripture in Malachi. But I'll share what else I came up with. So we don't know the time, we don't consider the time of John the Baptist and Jesus' first coming as a great and dreadful day of the Lord. We celebrate that. We celebrate that Jesus, or we celebrate that John came preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus comes. Boom, we got it, right? That's an excitement day. That is not a time of judgment. That's a time of good news that Jesus proclaimed the gospel in, the king, in God's kingdom, right? The day of the Lord means judgment. Now, in that place, Jesus didn't come to judge, right? Now, this is another reason why I, I don't think, I, this is why I think that Elijah will be back, is that um, John denies that he's Elijah. He said, listen, I am not Elijah. Listen, I'm not the dude. Listen, I'm not him. You know, how many times has he got to say, I'm not him? That's the second thing I came up with. Okay? You can study this stuff on your own, come to your own determination. Now, if you remember in the last classes that we've had, I've talked about something called the law of double reference. I don't know if, if it's something maybe you, I, I've taught you, maybe you heard somewhere else, or maybe it's the first time you're hearing this. It's when a scripture can be seen with a short term fulfillment and a future or longer or greater fulfillment that will happen in two different times in history. Malachi to me, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 is one of those. Where um, this is why for, we can surmise that John the Baptist is a short term fulfillment and Elijah will be the long term fulfillment. Uh, God will either, no, here's what I see God will either send Elijah back to the earth on a special errand or send someone uniquely empowered in the spirit in the office of Elijah. Okay? So this is something that you can study. This is something you can study on your own. Um, I gave you a few things you can look at, and then I got a couple more things to say. Um, why Elijah? Because listen, Elijah, if you look at his life, you know, I think one of my favorite stories with Elijah was in Mount Carmel, where he, where the prophets of Baal, there was a remember that great challenge. I remember they were running around the, the altar and they were cutting their arms and. You know, marking their bodies like um, you go back to Leviticus and it talks about don't mark yourself, don't tattoo yourself like the like the like the the, 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 the other people, the other the, from the other my paraphrase the other countries uh, that mark themselves for false gods. It's kind of like this with the, what they were doing up there, and and God came through. I mean, I mean, it just blows your mind that God said, "I'm God, I'm the only God." And then this, you know, think about Elijah's life, but he he was one that ministered in a time of crisis. In, in, in Israel uh, they were so far from God and we know from our studies of of um, the Old Testament God's people, God had poured himself out and even, even this, so many times um, to bring his people back uh, to, love, to love him the way they love their worldly things and other gods and stuff like that God had, God had done so much and he does that for us too God has poured out so much mercy and grace on us that we don't deserve you know, and I think and I think of all the things that, that, I, that I've been going through, things, the things I've said, and the, the stupid things I've said, the things, stupid things I've done in my life. I'm like, God, thank you for mercy and grace. Thank you for that. But um, it says on here, it says, Why Elijah? And, and it says, He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers. This speaks of family reconciliation and has in mind children to return to their fathers. Kind of like, um, where, where God wants His children to come home to Him, Israel, and that—that's to me is where you, I don't know where you stand on Revelation, the Book of Revelation, and will the church be there? Will the church not be there? To me, that's a time where God will take care and just open, the, basically, a communication with His people, His children, and, and say, "Listen, hey, I've, I'm here. I sent Jesus. You rejected Him, but here's another chance." 
And it, and it goes on and says, Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now the Old Testament ends with a ends with uh, threats threads of curse, but also expectations of a new dawning of the sun of righteousness. Listen. As, as, as even we close this, God has been a God of mercy and grace since the beginning. He has given people open opportun ample opportunities to to seek his face, his counsel, to follow him. And, you know, and people just continually reject him on a daily basis. And, I mean, could your, how hard could your heart be to reject Christ and what he gave? The free gift. I mean, I mean, have you been taken that far away that you, you can't see, you know, all you see is yourself and nothing else. That your desires, your wants. You know, and people are blind. They're blinded by the enemy. But God, even at the end, in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation, will show us that I am giving my people ample opportunity to repent. So no one can come up to God and say, you didn't give me enough opportunity. God is giving people enough opportunities to repent and come to know Him. And like I mentioned earlier, if you don't have that walk with God, just even now, surrender. Say, God, forgive me. I'm a sinful person. I need you to come and cleanse me. I need you to come and be Lord and Savior of my life. And now, Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would fill me. And, Father, that you would surround me with mercy and grace. And, Lord, that you would lead me. Lead me in my life. And if you did that, I challenge you to then to find yourself a good Bible teaching church. And those people in there who, who will love you, surround you, and and encourage you and and then and see you fulfill the call and the destiny that you have on that God has on your life for you. Well, that's all we have for today for the book of Malachi and the Minor Prophets. I hope you have enjoyed the Minor Prophets. I don't know what we're gonna be doing for the next several weeks, but I'll see you next Wednesday, if the Lord willing. And if you want to stop by First Assembly of God, Beaver Falls, up on Darlington. Come up and join us, 11 a.m., or you can see us on YouTube. But you have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Be blessed. Bye now.